Sure. Ready for me? Uh, I'll be giving a brief introduction. Okay. Okay. Perfect. About you know, you <clears throat> and... so hi everyone. Um, today we are very excited to have Redbus Bio Systems uh, here, and uh, from the company, um, Dr. Erin Glyn Davis will be presenting today, and uh, she actually has uh, in a couple of different locations for her training, uh, MIT. Uh, BS degree, Johns Hopkins master's degree, and Stanford PhD. After her education, then she has been working for a couple of companies, including Sequenta, 23andMe, uh, recently Illumina, before joining Ubus Bio Systems. And a lot of cool experience in the, uh, her um, you know, background. And today we are looking forward to hear from the, uh, from the work of Rebus Esper, a quantitative single molecule single cell spatial data with the subcellular resolution. And without further ado, I would like to turn to uh, Erin. Thank you so much, Ahmed, and thank you, Ron, both for uh, organizing this great seminar series. I know everyone has really enjoyed it. We've gotten a lot of value from being able to see everybody, you know, on the academic and industrial side in spatial omics. It's such an exciting time for all of us. And you guys are really doing a service to the community by putting this together. Um, like he said, I'm Aaron Davis from Rebus Biosystems, and I'm excited to be here today to share our recently launched and newly available uh, for purchase Rebus Esper spatial omics system. Um, so by all of you being here in the seminar series, I know it's not news to any of you that you need, you know, to understand biology, you really need to understand cells, and to understand cells, you need to understand their spatial context within tissues. And at Rebus Biosystems, our goal is really to, to deliver spatial omics technologies without compromise. And for us, what that really means is not compromising when it comes to the technology. We think you should be able to get resolution, scale, and speed all together in one instrument. Assays, we've built this platform that can really accommodate multiple assays so that you don't have to compromise. You can get exactly what you need for the experimental question you're asking and the phase of your research that you're in. And then usability. We really want this instrument and all of the tools that we build to be usable by everyone and really expand spatial omics across biology. So you don't have to be an expert in a certain technique and imaging or anything like that. That you, This is really a usable, easy to use uh, instrument that you'll be able to take advantage of because the important part is the data and the insights that you're gonna get from that. So without any further ado, meet Rebus Esper. <laughs> We launched at AGBT last month, and this is our first product in this quest for spatial omics without compromise. It's an integrated and automated platform. It brings together advanced imaging, on-system chemistry delivered through optimized fluidics, and an intuitive software suite all into a single instrument. Um, in today's presentation, I'll tell you about how all these pieces come together and share, share a little bit about the data that it enables, the high quality quantitative data, excuse me, that you'll be able to get from the Rebus Esper. Just to give a preview, here's a little uh, taste of the kind of data we're talking about. So it's multiplex, multi-omic, multi-scale spatial data. Um, you can explore biology at every level. You can see here, you know, starting with a section of the mouse brain, you're able to zoom in to sort of a regional view, can look at different structures, and then zoom in even further and see that subcellular detail in individual cells. And like I said, it's really important to us that this whole thing be really easy to use so that it's available to everyone. The Rebus Esper is really an end-to-end -end spatial omics solution with a streamlined workflow. In a nutshell, the process you see here on the slide is all it takes to get tens of millions of data points from hundreds of thousands of cells. Briefly, you prepare your sample, so you section tissue onto a cover slip that we uh, functionalize and provide to you. Once the tissue is on the cover slip, you fix it with a simple standard protocol. Then that fixed tissue on the cover slip is installed into the flow cell, which itself is then installed into the machine along with the reagents. And then there's just a few setup steps, press start, walk away until your data is ready. All of the imaging, all of the pretreatment before the imaging, all of that happens on, on the instrument as well as the data processing so that when you come back, you're ready to get into analysis. 
total hands-on time from the time that fixed tissue is on the cover slip to getting to the point where you can press start is under an hour and then it's completely walk away. So you really could load this up Friday afternoon before happy hour when those come back for all of us. And by the time you come into lab on Monday, your data will be ready for you hours before that. Um, really do want to emphasize that there's no sample preparation other than, you know, getting that, that tissue onto the cover slip and fixing it, which takes, you know, less than an hour itself, um, and getting it into the machine. And then there's no end time where you have to get into processing the data. That really, you know, we can do a centimeter squared, which is a, a size a lot of people reference, and I think it's helpful to all talk about the same thing, in just over two days. Um, so it's really easy to use and really streamlined so that you're able to focus on what's really important, which is all that data that's gonna come out at the end. Um, another thing that I mentioned at the outset that I think is really important, and we'll talk more in detail about chemistry, but what I wanna emphasize is that one of the compromises you avoid with rubus esper is having to pigeonhole your research with a single assay. Uh, different questions, different phases of research are going to require different approaches. And with the Rebus Esper, you get a single instrument that's going to run multiple assays. Our first assay that we released when we released the instrument at AGBT is the Esper High Fidelity Assay. It's the highest sensitivity and specificity assay you can get for spatial omics for gene expression analysis. You can do up to 30 custom genes, so whichever genes are most important to your research. And right now, it's optimized for fresh frozen tissues. But soon, Later this year, we'll be releasing updates to that Esper high fidelity assay. So we'll be increasing the plex and adding protein. So there'll be 50 RNA and 10 protein. Um, and we'll also be expanding to FFPE compatibility. Um, we'll also later this year be releasing the Esper high plex assay, which will allow analysis of more than 400 genes at a time. Then early next year, you can expect to see even more from Esper high fidelity. So increasing to 80 RNA, 15 protein, and as for high plex, going up to 1300 plus genes. So you're really going to have, you know, a lot of different assays for a lot of different phases of your research all in one machine. And then going into the future, we'll further increase RNA and protein plex. There'll be new assays, you know, new chemistries, um, new analytes, things like DNA, and the ability to, to process multiple samples on the instrument at the same time. So really, you know, wherever you are in your sort of experimental uh, pathway for whatever your question is, you'll be able to go from discovery to validation, hypothesis testing, and all the way back around with a single instrument. Um, you know, we, we won't be able to get into a lot of details about the, the coming assays, um, but we're happy to, to talk during the Q&A as much as we can. And finally, uh, I want to make sure it's clear that this is available now worldwide. So there's been a lot of news in the, the spatial omics world lately in the last few months, especially coming out of AGVT, which is wonderful. This is such an important general technique uh, for biology, and we're so happy to see the market and the, the uh, area of study expanding. Um, but it can be hard to keep track. And we want to make sure everybody knows that the Rebus Esper is available for purchase now. We've sold uh, several instruments. We've shipped uh, to Karolinska in Sweden and to UCSD. Our next two instruments will ship next week and we're expanding manufacturing. So we're ready to go if you're ready to go. And we're really excited to deliver this unprecedented combination of resolution and scale and speed um, to be able to give you this high throughput quantitative single molecule, single cell data with spatial context. So let's get into it. Uh, <laughs> we really believe that when it comes to understanding biology, seeing is believing, and that the most powerful spatial omics data is going to come from imaging-based techniques that allow you to visualize cellular features like transcripts in their native context. The heart of the Rebus Esper uh, is our synthetic aperture optics, or SAO. So with SAO, the sample is illuminated by a series of high resolution light patterns that are created by the interference of excitation laser beams. You can see an image of this on the right. The series of low resolution images is captured by a 20X error lens and then automatically reconstructed using proprietary algorithms to generate a single high resolution image with the equivalent resolution and sensitivity of a high numerical aperture 100X oil lens. So you can see here, 
the difference between the image on the left and the right. So that right is that reconstructed image and you get these exceedingly uh, sharp images, um, which are just amazing for annotating uh, RNA in the cells. So SAO gives you the best of both worlds, right? So you get the resolution equivalent to 100X oil lens, but you get the throughput that you get from having this big 20X field of view and, and depth of field. So our lateral resolution is 260 nanometers, and that's true optical resolution. We're not talking about the size of the pixels in our images. That's actually us resolving uh, objects that are that close to each other. And you get with this throughput, being able to look with a 20X lens across a tissue, you can do full tissue sections with that subcellular resolution, and it happens in a fraction of the time if we were using conventional microscopy. Uh, if we're gonna have such great optics, we wanna take advantage of those. And so SAO is really leveraged via another part of our instrument, which is the industry leading imaging area. So this is an image here on the left of the flow cell that goes inside of the instrument that you would have loaded your sample inside of. And you can see here, we're showing you the imaging area, the actual space where you can put tissue is three centimeters squared. With this large area, you have the freedom to place large tissue sections, maybe from a large human organ like the brain, which we've had several of our collaborators do. Or you can do, as we're showing here on the right, several smaller sections. Placing those multiple sections together allows you to minimize technical variation between samples that you're comparing. So for example, if you're looking at different conditions or genotypes and investigating subtle differences, you'll have them all in the same run. <laughs> Um, and when setting up your experiment, so you can have these multiple tissues, you can also choose multiple ROIs so that you can focus on what really matters most to you. So if only a fraction of that tissue matters to you, you've done your sectioning, it's on there, but you really want to focus in on a certain area, you can do that and that'll allow you to get your data faster because as fast as SAO is, the smaller area is going to be imaged faster. So acquiring the images, of course, is only one piece of the puzzle. To extract quantitative information from it, you're gonna need to process those images. And we've developed image processing software, and my colleague Matt is here who can talk more about this, um, and custom-built visualization tools to take the high-resolution images acquired with SAO and through the Rebus Esper and process it into data formats that you can use directly for single cell analysis and spatial mapping. Uh, as the images are acquired with SAO, they're processed on the fly so that a final analysis ready data package is ready soon after your package ends. So you're not waiting around that long after your acquisition. And our proprietary software uses state of the art vision, uh, computer vision algorithms to detect features such as RNA spots, segment the nuclei based on DAPI, and assign features to the nuclei. Then we stitch those images together for your whole ROI. The output of the Rebus Esper is the cell by feature matrix. It's a single file containing cell expression, single cell expression data for hundreds of thousands of cells and millions of cellular features, all of those RNA spots, all spatially annotated in XY space. The matrix is saved as a CSV file as well as hierarchical data formats so that the matrix can be easily converted and loaded into whatever single cell analysis pipeline uh, is right for your research. You also have access to all those raw RNA fish uh, images, if that's something you want to look at. We're not keeping you away from any of your raw data. I know sometimes people, especially in imaging, really want to make sure that they have access to that, and you definitely do. You also get the nuclei images for visualization of the tissue architecture, the feature maps that allow you to visualize gene expression patterns for each gene across that XY map, and the feature tables that are gonna tell you all of those detected spots, their locations and their assigned cells. On the visualization side, we have Esper Explore. So this is an interactive uh, package of software. It allows convenient visualization, exploration and editing of all of this multi-scale data that you're getting from the Rebus Esper. You can QC images from every stage of image processing. You can edit the data you know, we have a lot of things that we're doing automatically, but you know your biology best. And so if there's something you want to edit, we want to give you the power to do that. 
And then you can explore the rich multi-scale data with easy to use tools that allow you to zoom in and out, turn different channels on and off. So you can really get a sense of what's going on in these large, large tissues that you're looking at. So now I wanna switch gears. We've talked about hardware and software. Now we're gonna switch gears to talk about chemistry. So as I noted earlier, the first assay to be released for Rubis Esper is our Esper high fidelity assay. This is for RNA analysis. It's based on cyclic single molecule fish and it's optimized for our fluidics and imaging system. It allows you to detect and quantify individual transcripts in their native locations with the highest possible sensitivity. Here on the upper right, what you can see is a schematic of our probe design. So each probe has a target binding site and then two flaps, which are targeted by the fluorescently tagged readout probes over the course of the cyclic imaging. The sensitivity and resolution of SAO allows us to detect a signal without massively amplifying it. So we don't have to use any kind of branching or anything like that. So our probes can be small enough that they access both the nucleus and the cytoplasm, which can be important if you're looking at long non-coding RNAs or nascent RNAs. Uh, a probe tiling strategy is used. So for each target gene, we tile multiple probes across that gene that allows us to make sure that you're only seeing signals. So we only see signal when there's enough uh, probes actually on the gene. You get that specificity that's gonna really give you high quality data. And then the way we achieve a high level of multiplexing is we don't use any barcoding or enzymatic amplification. Instead, as depicted on the right, what we do is we read out one gene per channel per cycle. At the end of the cycle, the signal is neutralized followed by another round. And in our standard configuration, that means we have three genes per, per uh, cycle. So you can see in the schematic here on the, the right at the bottom, total of 15 genes over five cycles is shown for illustrative uh, purposes. But the first release, as I mentioned earlier, of S4 High Fidelity allows for analysis of up to 30 genes. You simply provide us your list of genes and we design the probes and send you your custom kit. When we talk about S4 High Fidelity, and I've talked about the Rebus S4, you know, I've really tried to make it sound, which it is, really simple and easy to use, straightforward. You're gonna go from sample to data very quickly. We're gonna send you the kits that you need. You know, all of this is taken care of you, uh, for you. But it kind of belies just how transformative it is to have this productized, easy to use option for SM Fish. And so I wanna compare sort of what you get with the Rebus Esper to a, a very similar kind of study uh, that was done, published in Nature Methods in 2018. Um, you see the reference down here from Cotalupia et al. So in this paper, they use conventional high-resolution microscopy, so 100x oils, these stacking, uh, for a version of fish called awesome fish, which is very similar to the chemistry we use. And they were looking at the cellular organization of the mouse somatosensory cortex. Um, so they looked at 33 genes in just a small 3.8 millimeter squared uh, section of the mouse brain, and it took them six and a half days to image. And that's just the imaging, so there was no data processing in, involved in that. You did a very similar experiment, so just 30 genes, but in the 60 millimeter squared section, the whole mouse brain could get 120,000 cells, which is 4,800. For us, that would take less than two days, and that includes your data processing. Um, just for comparison, to, to really hammer it home, using uh, what they use in Cotalupi et al, uh, with you know, 100X and Z stacking, um, it would have taken 101 days to image a whole mouse brain. And my, my point here in comparing is not at all to say anything negative about this research, quite the opposite. It's beautiful and really valuable work, but it's not feasible for most people, right? This is a great way of really investigating cellular architecture, but it's just not gonna be feasible for most people. And that's what we're really excited to do is democratize this kind of analysis so that people can validate and extend their early discovery focused work, maybe coming from SDRNAC and be able to use the gold standard for gene expression analysis to really look at what's going on in cells in tissue. So multiplex quantitative gene expression data with subcellular de detail, now routine and reliable and plug and play for people. The Esper high fidelity assay has been validated across a variety of fresh frozen mouse and human tissues 
The selection of these, brain, liver, prostate, breast, lung, is shown here on the slide, but this list is growing by the day. We've opt and we've validated in both normal and cancer tissues. And really a, a powerful part about what we've developed, you know, in this integrated automated system with this easy to use chemistry and flow cell and all of these things is also, you know, through our fluidics design and, and how we've put the, the assay together, we've really come up with this universal pretreatment protocol that allows us to work across samples. So whether or not they have high background, maybe lipofusin, we're able to deal with all of that. Our fluidics can deliver all of the reagents at the optimal temperature and flow rate. And so really get those reactions perfect and as fast as possible. Again, helping you to get from sample to data as, as fast as possible. The S for high fidelity assay that I've just told you about, so 30 custom genes based on SMFish, really high sensitivity and specificity, is really ideal for people who've done this early discovery focused research and now want to validate and extend uh, and really dig into their hypothesis. Our early customers have used S for high fidelity to validate single cell RNA sequencing results and to discover spatial patterns for new cell types that they've identified. They've also used it for cell type composition and disease biomarkers across genotypes, so certain uh, disease models that they're working in. The high sensitivity and specificity combined with that resolution and throughput of the rebus ESPER really uniquely positions this assay for detection of critical biomarkers and gene signatures, especially in relatively rare cells. So we really can detect them and you can look at enough tissue to really find those rare cells. But, you know, I'm bringing this slide back because I do want to emphasize that a key feature of the Rebus Esper is the flexibility and the fact that the assay menu is going to grow. We're going to be growing Esper high fidelity and adding high flex and a variety of other assays in the future. So now I want to show you a little bit about what Rebus Esper and Esper high fidelity can do. So let's get into a little bit of data. So here is um, some data. I've shown this image uh, a few times earlier. So this is a whole kernel section of the mouse brain. We looked at 24 genes um, in a section that's about 60 millimeters squared, 10 micron thick. In total in this image, there's about 120,000 cells and about 14 million RNA spots that were detected. And it took us a little less than two days to go from sample so on the cover slip to that process data ready for analysis. In this set of 24 genes, what you can see is that there's seven control or housekeeping genes, and then there's 17 cells, just 17 cell typing uh, genes. So really a small number of cell type specific genes. But I'm gonna show you what we can do with that due to the sensitivity of our assay. So you can see here on the left, uh, we were able to identify all the major cell types of the mouse brain, both neuronal and non-neuronal. Unsupervised clustering using Leiden algorithm and UMAP produces the plot you see here, where each color coded cluster corresponds to a unique cell type. So they're labeled and then you have the number across the right. Um, on the right, you can see the dot plot that's plotting each gene that we were looking at next, you know, against each of those clusters. And I wanna point out a few interesting points that demonstrate that only this relatively small number of genes, like I said, can really uh, result in excellent cell typing um, when you have such a sensitive assay and ultra high resolution imaging. So first, I'm gonna call your attention to cluster 18. So these are microglia. You can see them, I boxed it over here on the, the left there. It's a tiny little cluster there towards the middle of the UMAP. And if you look at the dot plot, you can see that this is really defined by their high expression of hex B and low expression of almost everything else. Um, and what's exciting here is that microglia are really a very small proportion of the total cells in the brain. And it can be difficult to cluster them when you have less sensitive methods because you're not detecting all of those. You know, you have low expression and a low number of genes. But we're able to easily define this thanks to our ability to find and count virtually every transcript in the image that we're looking at. Uh, next, I wanna call your attention to the algo precursor and algo dendrocyte clusters. So here, cluster 12 and zero over here on the left. And you can see in the UMAP, you can actually see um, there's sort of a line connecting those. It's colored as, um, as 12. Oh, we went back. 
<laughs> it's colored as uh, cluster 12. And if you look at the dot plot, we can see that in clusters 0 and 12, both are high in SOX10, which is defi defining for this broad group of cells. But we can see that the oligodendrocyte, oligodendrocytes excuse me, have high PLP1, while the precursors lack expression of this gene, instead having high expression of PGFRA. All of this is expected based on previous work. But what's crucial here is with just a handful of genes, due to the high sensitivity, we're can, we can detect that transition state. And so what we're detecting in that line that you see between those two clusters is you know, as one gene goes up and one goes down. And so we're, we're able to see those fine details um, and detect that transition state. And then finally on this, I just wanna um, focus on these reference or housekeeping genes that are boxed down at the left, the seven genes that were not cell type specific. And at first glance, you know, they look pretty even expression. You know, there's some differences, but if you really dig in, those differences can make a difference make a difference. <laughs> For example, the non-renal cells in clusters 0, 1, and 12 um, have lower expression overall of these housekeeping genes, which is uh, expected based on their more quiescent state. Then if we look at cluster 14, which uh, corresponds to the amygdala, you can see that even though it is a neuronal cell type expected to be fairly active, uh, there is low expression of ACT-B in round 1. And I am certainly not the person to get into the, the biology of this here, but simply want to point it out that, you know, when you have a really carefully chosen set of genes, a relatively small number of genes can lead to excellent cell type differentiation. So further looking into this data, when we take that clustering that was done in that UMAP that you still see here on the left, when we map those clusters back to XY space uh, based on the cell by feature matrix that the rebus asper outputs, the identified cell clusters clearly display the expected uh, spatial organization and faithfully recapitulate the tissue architecture that you see here on the right. Um, called out down here at the bottom, you can see excitatory, inhibitory, and non neuronal cells where expected in the brain. And I want to call special attention over here in the non neuronal cells, um, the epin mole cells, I have trouble with that word. Uh, you can see here that the rebus esper data faithfully identified this thin single cell thick layer. And you can actually, in, in the whole layer around the brain, you can see it if you look closely. So, you know, with our, our high resolution, with our high sensitivity, we found this small group of cells and we can find them all around just in a single cell layer, which I think is pretty impressive. And then finally, I want to share how the relative abundance is of all the different cell types uh, shook out in uh, comparison with previously published data. So you can see here on the left, we have a map, the same one you saw before in the different areas of the brain. And then on the right, you can see a comparison of the, the percentages of the neuron, neuronal and non-neuronal cells compared with published data. Um, there are small differences in the neuronal cells from the published data, but those are explained by uh, the published data being from a slightly more anterior section of the brain. Um, so again, probably sound like a broken record, but I think it's really important. Whereas other methods really rely on looking at a large number of genes with low sensitivity to type and map cells through imputation, the S for high fidelity has this really high sensitivity and allows you to have this level of precision and identification and mapping with a small number of genes. And so when you've gone from sort of discovery down to you've found the genes that are most important for your question, you'll really be able to get a lot of information with the rebus esper and the esper high fidelity assay. I am coming to the end of my slides. I hope you've enjoyed this whirlwind tour, the rebus esper. Um, before I end, you know, I just want to reiterate that my goal here today was to give you an overview of our platform. It's bringing an unprecedented combination of resolution, scale, and speed to spatial omics. It's fully integrated and automated. The optics, the fluidics, the intuitive software, and those optimized assays that we're bringing to it with this ever-expanding men menu. And all of those have been designed to give you this really streamlined workflow that has minimal hands-on time, the total walk-away operation, and gives you data really, really quickly. So for, again, you know that reference one centimeter squared, you can get that in just over two days. 
before I go, important for everybody on this call is that we do have an S for Spatial Omics grant uh, that is closing next week. So applications are due by April 30th. So this is open to academic and nonprofit institutions in the US, EU, uh, UK, and Ireland. So what we're offering is the opportunity to have up to 10 runs with up to 30 custom genes, up to three centimeters squared of um, imaging on the Rebus Esper, you would send your samples to us, which need to be fresh frozen, mouse or human, and we'd run them in our lab. So please visit grants.rebusbio.com and uh, give us your best ideas and what you'd like to try out. We'd really look forward to reading your submissions. Uh, Rebus, Rebus Biosystems, we take our name from the Rebus puzzle, which is a representation of words using objects for the sounds of those words. And really for us, Unraveling biology and how all this uh, works together is the most important puzzle that humanity will ever uh, solve. And so we're excited to be part of helping people do that. So here on the right, I have a rebus for you. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions. Our contact information is here on the left. And of course, we're here for the um, Q&A. My colleagues, Matt Kai and Brett Cook will be joining me um, to answer all of your questions. So with that, I am done. Yeah, super exciting talk. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> so uh, I think for the audience, if you have questions, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, you, you can also use in the chat box um, if you don't want to turn on your camera. Uh, so this is a very, very informative uh, we're not doing webinar, but really kind of the informative uh, forum uh, for us to exchange ideas. Hi, Aaron. Uh, I had a question. Hi, Rong. Hi. Um, I actually thank you so much for the presentation. It was really nice. I saw actually Brett's presentation at the uh, recently at the Special Biology. So you know. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so I had a question about the chemistry. So am I correct to assume that when you do the neutralization uh, steps after each imaging round, um, there is a completely different set of hybridization process going on again? And if so, why are you limited only to 30, um, 30 sets of genes of the probes? Is it tissue integrity? I'm gonna let Brett take this one. Okay, thank you. I think it's the best to, to answer this really thoroughly for you. So yes, that's correct. So we, in a single step, add in all of our non-labeled primary probes and then read out a set of three genes per cycle using fluorescently labeled readout probes. So between each cycle, we're introducing another set of readout probes to be able to bind those targets, image them, and then those probes are neutralized. So then why only up to 30? Right. So uh, there is the issue of, of, of tissue integrity. There is the issue of backup of fluorescence over time. Mm -hmm. Now, we have extended this assay uh, experimentally up to 45 targets so far. We find that capping it at 30 gives the best results across many different tissue types. So we're working to expand the plex of the cyclic assay beyond 30. At this point, we're leaving it at 30 right now. It gives us the best performance. And, and final question, final follow up, and then I will, uh, <laughs> I will let other people ask. Um, do you, what do you think would be the, the number that you will achieve over time, like with the next generation? How many probes will you be able to go up to? So by the end of this year, we're expecting to increase our high fidelity plex up to 50 RNA targets plus 10 protein targets to be co-detected in the same tissue section. Also, our, on the other side, our high plex assay that we're planning to release will be 448 targets in the same section, RNA only to start. So, so yes, yeah, so as we do plan to increase plex of our current high fidelity assay, as well as introduce new assays that achieve even higher plex. Thank you so much. Thanks for the question. Yes, thank you so much. And I'll just add that in the first half of next year, as for high fidelity, we'll go up to 80 and 15 proteins. So we're working on extending it all the time. And, you know, you'll really be able to pick what's what's right for you. Thank you. Yeah, so also, Karen, maybe I can give a little bit of my own experience to share with you. 
uh, I, it seems like uh, most uh, data, so every present today is not from FAP, right? It's uh, probably fresh frozen, but somehow you're fixed with PFA. Uh, but our experience seems like you will be surprised actually FAP <laughs> might work even better for, uh, for the kind of RNA detection. And uh, people often say, okay, FAP, okay, RNA degradation. But when you look at the, the, the transcripts in situ, right? So in the tissue, we have seen that over and over. So sometimes you, 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 you see actually a lot better data from FAP compared to fresh frozen. Um, yeah, I would say, I think Aaron and Brett, probably you, you should jump to the FAP right away. You may, <laughs> you may get a much better data. Yeah, and I see here in the chat, there is a question of whether or not uh, our assay is for fresh or for FAPE. So currently, as for high fidelity, is for fresh frozen. Um, but later this year, we will be extending that to FFPE. And I know that a lot of people are really excited about that. There's a lot of samples out there. Um, there's another question in the chat about um, what's the cost per sample and how many samples can be done in parallel. So the cost per run, so you know that we send you a kit that has enough um, reagents and, and materials for 10 runs and the cost per run is 1,280. It's not a cost per sample because the number of samples you're doing actually is gonna depend on what you load up into that really large area, right? So our flow cell has an imageable, in, imageable area of three centimeters squared. And as I showed, you could fit, you know, three sections of mouse brain in there, right? So it's, you know, divide that cost per run by those number of samples. And so I think that also answers the question of how many in parallel. It really depends on the size of the tissue that you wanna do um, and what you can get in there. So great talk, Erin. So uh, following up on what Brett was saying, right? Um, so for the Esper Hyplex assay, if you are doing 480 genes, so does that come at any, let's say, um, with lower sensitivity or how do you see that, I mean, compared to 30 genes versus 480? Thanks for that question, Netchket. Uh, We'll be releasing more information on the exact details of that assay over time. The 448 plex expected by the end of this year will likely have a small compromise in sensitivity. Of course, to get up to that higher plex, you have to make a few compromises. Um, so that's why we started with our low plex, high fidelity assay, which we feel is missing from the market right now, really to do validation of single cell sequencing results. Thanks. And maybe one follow-up question. So also you mentioned sensitivity and also Erin mentioned about sensitivity also in comparison with awesome fish. So if you again, look at the numbers, so how does that look like? I mean, you showed beautiful picture of awesome fish and also the data that you put from Brabus. So how does that look like if you, let's say take, I don't know, a gene in particular, let's say SNAP25, I don't know which origin from your panel. So how does that look like? Both assays are gold standard single molecule fish. The awesome fish paper actually used Stellaris, which has directly labeled probes, and they had to use more aggressive stripping measures to get those probes off of their targets. Um, so, so our assay is based on the same design principles, the same tiled strategy, and we've, we've, we've measured our sensitivity to, at 90%. So that's 90% detection efficiency, which uh, is the same as gold standard fish is known to be extremely high, the highest that you can get. Yep, thanks. So as we, uh, there's one more question, I guess. After that, I'll ask a question. Okay. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. Will the cycle speed be the same for the higher plex assays? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know that we can really comment on that right now. Um, I think we'll have to wait until we can uh, release more information about the exact nature of those assays. So uh, the question that I was gonna ask is about the imaging system, right? So you guys are using 20X, then there are different angle eliminations. Then you scan the sample with different illumination patterns, right? So that, seems to be adding to the time as well, because per image, you need to look at a couple of times then reconstruct it, right? Based on the structured information map that I remember from my grad school, this is, I think, how it should look like. So if you compare this map 
to let's say 40x and scan it directly, still the aperture optics is faster. I mean, that's one question. The second question is 20x is lower sensitivity. So how do you retain the, I mean, sensitivity back to 60x level, right? Because at the beginning, you lose a lot of photons with the 20x. I mean, you're probably looking at different K vectors coming into the camera, right? But still, I think, will that be less sensitive or you still retain it uh, at the level that it's competitive with 60x? Your first question on the imaging speed. Because we're using a 20x lens, we get to retain the large depth of field of that 20x lens, 2.8 microns. So for each Z plane that we take multiple exposures from using our, our um, synthetic aperture optics method and do that reconstruction, if you take into account the larger field of view of the 20x lens, as well as the added depth of field, when you compare that to a 100x oil immersion, well, you have to take Z stacks to get to that same Z depth the throughput is actually much faster, about 70 times faster than if you're doing Z planes with a smaller field of view. To, to your question about the sensitivity of the optics. So we are using the 20X lens for collection only. Um, we're, we're using our, our SAO optics to illuminate the sample using a synthetic aperture. So we're illuminating the sample from outside of the objective. And what we have found is that actually when you compare the SAO images in the very same cell to images produced with the 100X oil immersion, the sensitivity found is actually better. That you can pick out even finer signals from that image than you can with the 100X oil lens. Oh, so yeah, is that just... because I think mm -hmm. with, with the lower uh, power objective, uh, you are no longer that sensitive to the Z axis, Z focal plane, right? So our, our 20X lens, the, it's, I think it's a 0.45 NA lens. Uh, mm -hmm. Our effective NA based on the angle of illumination is about 1.3. Yeah, also I think in the imaging, um, like a wide field imaging, uh, it's becoming uh, kind of more and more uh, powerful. I think I, uh, since you guys are in Bay Area, I would like to kind of refer you to one of my friends at UC Berkeley, Laura Walker. Okay. Uh, yeah, she's doing some synthetic imaging or computational imaging. Basically, uh, it's a very simple, low power objective lens, but you can get an extremely large field of view. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, I'd be uh, very interested to talk to her. Yeah. I think at UC Berkeley Electrical Engineering. Yeah. Thank you. Also, I have a yeah. question. So, okay. so now when you do your third plex, uh, it takes about two days. Uh, but uh, if you do like a 300, does that mean you, you need a 20 days? Or is there any way you can kind of multiplex the, the each step, right? So, so that's right. It's not going to take 30 days to do 448 <laughs> plex. You'll be reading more mo, mo, per cycle. You'll be reading many more targets than our current, which is just a sequential linear method, right? One, one gene per, per die per cycle. Mm. And what, what's the estimate kind of assay time per, per sample, if you can get up to like a 1000, which is what I'm very interested in. We'll be very happy to share that once it's available. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question here in the chat. Um, Emma is asking for tiling probe design, what is the limit on target length and the limit on targeted transcript abundance within cells? I.e., is there any expansion of the tissue that improves your ability to resolve abundant transcripts? Great question. For the tiling probe design, we design anywhere from 22 to 96 target specific probes per assay. Well, that means that your total length of your RNA transcript can be about five, 500 nucleotides. So when you submit a, a custom gene list to us and, and we do the probe design, um, we're designing to about 70 to 80% of genes across the whole transcriptome. As far as um, a limit on targeted uh, transcript abundance within single cells. So because we are not using a combinatorial method, we have each of our genes assigned to one die in one cycle the dynamic range is very high. So we can detect both low expressing and high expressing gene targets in the same cell. Uh, 
Um, our experience has been anywhere from one target per cell to about 300 targets per cell before you start getting into the optical crowding problem, which you then suggest uh, expansion. It's, very, it's a very interesting concept here. And our current assay does not use expansion. Um, so, so yes, you could begin to resolve very high expression targets um, by separating them out a little more. Uh, the issue is your, your sample gets larger as well. So your imaging time increases. So depending on the exact targets you're looking at, if they are extremely high expression and you need to be able to tell them apart, then, then expansion may be required for that. But our current assay just does, does not use expansion technology. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. So as we are um, waiting, so the, the device that you have, is it, how big is it? And I mean, the picture, is it the bench top thing or is it like a Illumina big sequencer size or how is it? it it's more on the sequencer size. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a floor standing model about chest high and about two feet across. And it has the, the refrigerated reagent storage component in one um, module and it has the, the optical component and the waste and a, a few indicator lights on the front, but everything is controlled with the, the software on the computer that's installed next to the instrument. And then the sample holder is just a slide? Our flow cell accepts our, our cover glass, which is a functionalized cover glass as Aaron mentioned. Um, it's, a, it's, a sh it's a 10 minute assembly process to take the cover slip with the fixed tissue and assemble into the flow cell. And then you're ready to connect the flow cell to the reagent lines and the cooling lines of the instrument. And then you're ready to start your run. Mm -hmm. So for the cover glass, actually one thing that I'm also having difficult with my own collaborators is that typically these things, they come in slides, right? when you get these tissues. And when you talk to even histologists, right? They're like, oh, slides. But when you talk to them about cover slips, they're a little bit hesitant to cut it into very thin, right, pieces. So what would be the solution for this? Have you guys addressed this problem? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. And we're, we're a little bit of imaging snobs. And we, we think that, that cover glasses give superior image quality to slides. Just the thickness of the glass has an effect on your quality of your image. Now, our solution to this is to have our, our chip be semi-preassembled where there can be a backing plate, for example, on the cover glass itself that you can use for sectioning. So you're breaking less cover glasses when you're actually doing your sectioning. So that, that's something that, that, that we'll, we'll be thinking about here. I'm sure that would be great. Hi, Brett, one more question maybe from my side. So sure. um, when you have 50 mRNAs and 10 proteins, so is it on the same sample or consecutive sections? That's correct on the same exact sample. Thanks. Yeah, I think for uh, uh, many people here, probably one important question I, I think for everyone. Okay, for example, if I want to put this instrument in my grant proposal next month, how much <laughs> I need to budget? <laughs> Aaron, would you like to take that question? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, the cost of the instrument is in the mid 400s, um, but it, there's a few things that can contribute, you know, up or down, depending on certain configurations. So anybody who is interested, we are happy to talk to you and would love to have someone from our sales team have a discussion with you about exactly what you need and how we can help you get the funding, because we think this is going to give a lot of value to your research and we want to get it out there. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. one more question in the chat. Yeah, also I'm a little bit kind of biology focused when I look at your, your data. So uh, I think that I remember in a yo map, uh, you were able to see, so those endothelial cells as well, right? So actually a lot of endothelial cells that really surprised me. Uh, so, but when I look at the spatial pattern, somehow I don't see the endothelial cells from kind of kind network, right? Which you expect sort of the microvascular network. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, what 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 is your interpretation there? Wrong. I'd love to connect you with our, our mm -hmm. resident neuro neuroanatomist mm -hmm. Marcos to be able to answer that question correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably the data we, we want to generate and compare notes. Great. 
Um, so there is another question here in the chat. Um, remember the slides went. Um, is a sample still usable after the process for subsequent staining slash imaging for click chemistry or antibody stains, for example? So yes, so the tissue is, is not destroyed. It depends on what target you're looking at. So if, if you'd like to use the tissue after for, um, for kind of basic histological stains, then it's available for that. However, as part of our, our tissue pretreatment protocol, we do digest protein targets. This is for our current high fidelity assay. And if you'd like to use it for uh, immunohistochemistry after you do your 30 plex RNA readouts, then depending on the target, you may see quite a reduced signal occurring because the, the protein has, the, basically the epitope is not available. Um, uh, for click chemistry, I'm very curious to understand what you're thinking here. Um, but if, if the target is still there, has not been digested, then uh, it should be available for additional stains. The, the, the assembled, um, chip, which has uh, the backing plate, the gasket, and the cover slip. Once you assemble, uh, it's difficult to disassemble that. For example, if you wanted to use the cover glass for something else. However, you can leave it assembled and you can flow reagent into that chip and put it on your microscope if you'd like to do additional analysis. Thanks for the question. So can you also imagine the z-axis get a kind of 3D, uh, yeah, for example, after clearance? <laughs> so our, cur our current imaging method images a single z-plane, and that's with our 20x objective 2.8 microns uh, imaging depth. Now, the optics are certainly capable of z-stacking, but what we found is that with a, a tissue section, a thin tissue section, 10 microns, there's diminishing returns of doing Z stacking after you do a single plane, just because the imaging time can take a lot longer. Um, so it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something interesting that we've considered, but have come to this point um, with, with proof that one, a single Z plane with our optics captures the majority of targets in, in that tissue section. Yeah, maybe it's worth uh, try so kind of take that relatively thick tissue section and uh, do tissue clearance and and then you can really say see, see kind of 3D architecture of your tissue. Yeah, I really think your 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 system uh, has the capability to to, to do so. <laughs> So we have our, our optics have about an eight millimeter working distance. So a very, very uh, long, long, long way it can travel from, from one Z plane to another. So Brett, maybe just uh, one question on this Z uh, thing that Rong asked. So you said if, it, if you are taking images, let's say only in one plane, you are capturing most of the information. So let's assume that your cell body is, I don't know, let's say 10 microns in, I don't know, diameter or whatever that is. But your one plane is going to be only about a couple of hundred nanometers, right? So probably, um, or how, how, because let's say if you take uh, 10 sections throughout the depth of that cell body, of course, you're going to capture more signals, right? Or that's not the case. Or it, it, do I understand you correctly? So our, 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 our current protocol is validated from five micron to 12 micron thick cryosections. Um, now our, our 20X lens, the depth of field is 2.8 microns. So you get a very large depth of field with each acquisition in each plane. Now, now what we discovered is that up, upon sectioning, the cells at the top and the bottom of your section uh, they've been sliced through and you, there aren't a lot of targets still present in those cells. Uh, and the majority of targets occur in the middle of your section. And so basically our, our autofocus locks on to where the most targets exist in the tissue. And what we found is that a single Z plane with our 20X lens captures the majority of targets. Understood, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nexuket. So uh, one question from here. So the aperture optics, when you use multiple colors, how bad is the chromatic aberration? Can you guys hit to the same region? Yes, great question. So we use a filter wheel. It has 10 positions. So we use various filters to be able to, to separate out the channels. So, but we do use individual lasers. So we have the three different laser lines for each of our gene targets for each cycle. 
Now, what you can expect is uh, a little bit of bending of light when it enters the filter itself. Uh, and that can lead to some chromatic aberration that occurs. Now, so what we've been able to do is measure this chromatic aberration in our system and found that it's stable over time. So what we've done is we, we have a, a method that corrects for this chromatic aberration within each cycle so that your different gene targets can line up exactly on top of each other. What our software does automatically from cycle to cycle is registers those images from different cycles to be able to visualize all 30 targets in one image. The, the um, precision of that registration software is a single micron. So from different cycles, you can overlay those images to about one micron of, of, of accuracy. So of course, we, we actually provide all of the raw images for you. So you can do whichever if you have a registration um, that you'd like to apply with known targets that should be in the, the same exact pixel locations, you, you're welcome to do that as well. Great. Yeah, uh, so maybe I can uh, ask the last question uh, yeah. on the computational side, I think uh, ask Matt. <laughs> uh, I, I think in a, uh, the raw data is really like a, the stars in the sky, right? Just a bunch of dots. And uh, then you, you do segmentation. I think there are different pipelines there. But I, I, when I look at your, your data presentation, I think you guys did a very, very good job to, to segment the cells. Uh, but, but my understanding, you didn't do any kind of dappy nuclear standing. So uh, what, what, what's your unique uh, computational approach to, uh, to identify kind of nuclear versus kind of cytosolic? RNA and how to do the segmentation there. Yeah, so I, I think uh, Aaron may just have not mentioned the fact that we do DAPI segmentation. Um, I, actually, I think, she, I think she did, but that is the, um, the main image that we use for cell segmentation. So we take through the DAPI stain and then we use, um, currently we're using Stardust to get this very beautiful, accurate uh, nuclear segmentation. Um, but of course, you know, we're keeping our eye out on new developments in the, the um, image segmentation field and we can, you know, we will adapt and, and improve that as, as better technologies come out. And like we've mentioned already, you know, you will have the access to your own images. So you can, uh, if you develop, if you are a bioinformatician or someone who um, yeah, is interested in image analysis, uh, you can develop better methods uh, and even share it with us. And we'd be very happy to, uh, mm -hmm. to learn from um, the community. Um, and then, yeah, so basically it's nuclear segmentation. Currently we do not do any sort of cytoplasmic seg segmentation. And as you could see that even with just those um, uh, nuclear stains, we're able to get good segmentation. Um, we do some a little bit fancier spot to cell assignment. Uh, so it's not only limited to the spots that are within the nuclei, but also uh, you know, spots that are nearby. Um, but yeah, we're, we're definitely, one of the things we wanna do uh, really soon is take the protein segmentation, like the antibody stains and use that for cytoplasmic stains and yeah. better segmentation results. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Great. the question. Yeah. Yeah. I think is that, uh, are there any questions? If not, I think let's thank the speaker again. And let me use this uh, clapping sign. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron, uh, Brad, and Matt. This was a fantastic talk. And uh, next week, we will have uh, another speaker from industry, uh, actually from NanoString. Uh, they will be presenting about spatial molecular imager. And as you might remember, in the previous seminar series, we had them again, but this time they're presenting a newer technology. And that's why we look forward to learning more about that. And with this, then I think we will be wrapping up for today. And thank you guys again for attending. And thank you, Rebus Y Systems, for today's seminar. And hope to see you guys next week. Bye bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you.